Good morning, everyone. Uh, so what I would like to do is to start by uh, trying to establish a biblical foundation for the language of family, the concept of family, being the, one of the principal uh, ways that the Bible describes the church. So um, I think it's important to understand if, if we, those of us who are in leadership, if we go away to some college to get trained and then we apply for a post and then we go into that post and we do a job, that can all be very organizational. It doesn't ne it's not necessary that um, you'd even form any relationships by doing that. You could go through an entire system, lead an entire church without it being in any way, shape, or form a relational experience. And sadly, many leaders do find themselves in such positions and either end up becoming rather burned out, isolated, disillusioned, lonely. And the reason is, quite frankly, they may well have got great content in their training. They may well have had a great opportunity in the church that they were leading. But they've been doing it in a way and with a DNA and with a kind of an environment that God never intended. God intends us to be in, in a sense of family. The church is the family of God. Now, that we have to start with these principles and then build our practice out of them. You'll hear us say that again and again through these um, times together. So... For example, in um, Romans uh, 8.15, these are, these are not unfamiliar verses, but just talking about how God views us in Romans 8.15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then in Galatians, uh, he makes the same point to a different group of people. Because you are sons, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I think for, particularly in a context where we are uh, evangelicals, and one of the very strong things that we rightly uh, robustly defend and, and hold true as one of our unifying things is, is uh, a penal substitution, the, the atonement of Christ uh, uh, on the cross, you know, the justification, doctrine of justification. That's a, a massive deal for us. We say, no, we're evangelical, we believe in, the, in justification. But I, I would want to just push on that a little bit and say, Justification, yes, is our greatest need, but I would say our greatest privilege is the doctrine of adoption. And justification was necessary in order to acquire adoption. Adoption isn't a byproduct. Adoption, being called God's family, being adopted as his sons and daughters, that was the goal that God had in mind in the first place, which made justification necessary. So it's really important we understand, say for example, if uh, we use the courtroom analogy of, of uh, the judge and the accused, we're guilty of sin, the judge could rightly condemn us, uh, and then Jesus takes our place, we're acquitted because someone else takes the punishment. We're familiar with that sort of legal transaction of Jesus standing in our place, the doctrine of justification, of substitutionary atonement. We understand that. But it's not necessary to the legal system for the judge to adopt the accused. It's not an inevitability. You don't, you don't find judges with enormous families because they've just been judges for 20 years and every time someone's acquitted, they have to adopt them as into their family. Very large family holidays everywhere, these judges with coach loads of children that they've had to adopt. The point is that adoption is not necessary for justification to be effective. So God could have justified us, forgiven us our sins, cleansed us from unrighteousness, sent his son to die for us. He could have done that, and we go to heaven, know what it is to have eternal life, but still be kept at this lower level of relationship. It's ever so important we understand adoption was always the goal in mind. Justification is the road we traveled to to get to the unreachable. Now, that's a, 
a massive implication. Uh, J.I. Packer uh, says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much they, they make of the thought of being God's child and having God as their father. Our, our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. So it's, he, he makes uh, uh, another point. Um, he says, what is the highest privilege of the gospel? What is a Christian? Well, this question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification. To be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is even greater. Now that, that foundation, therefore, must flavor how the church functions. It must flavor how we relate to one another, how we relate to God. It, God has always wanted a family. He's wanted a people. He's wanted that. It, in Ephesians, it talks about he's adopted us according to his pleasure and will. He didn't have to do it, but it gives him pleasure to have a family. Now, you can trace all of that through the Old Testament, the language of the Old Testament. In Genesis, when Genesis 17, verse 4, he says to Abraham, you will be a father of many. The idea, it didn't say you'll do a great job and accumulate a huge following. He said you'll be a father. It's in the very language of how uh, God communicates to, um, to Abraham. Um, we find in um, Genesis 49, verse 1 to 4, when J Jacob gathered his sons and prophesied inheritance over them. There's a, a family passing on of one, the blessing of one generation to another. It's not uh, Jacob handing over the family business and let's sign it all over legally. And da, da, da. No, he, he blesses and prophesies over his sons. They're dear to him. They've all got their own unique callings and he releases them. He blesses them. We find in Proverbs, uh, listen, my son, to a father's advice. It's it's family. It's, it's not, here's a training course on how to avoid adultery and foolishness. It's not a training course. He said, listen to me. Let me tell you what I've learned. I want to sit you down and, and, and give you some advice. Psalm 139 is a very affectionate psalm. Lord, you know me when I stand, when I rise. You understand me before a word is on my tongue. You know it completely. Th these are intimate uh, dealings between God and, and man. So we find that even in the Old Testament, before we even get the full revelation of, of Trinity and all that comes with that. And so when we get into the New Testament, I, I can only give you a, 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 an in, a, a kind of a random number of illustrations because it's flavored all through the New Testament. But just some examples. We find... Um, in, uh, let's look at uh, some verses in, in Timothy. These, these are just examples of family language being used. So 1 Timothy uh, 5 and verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Do you see the family language that Paul is saying? This is the culture. This is the way church should function. You, you, you view people with family kind of um, uh, uh, lenses. You, you view it that way. Um, in, um, in uh, let's think, uh, in, one to, in the first, no, I looked at that one, sorry. Um, yeah, verse 8. He says, if anyone doesn't provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. He's talking there even about, you know, family 
matters whether they're in the church or not. It's, just, it's not just um, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's something God has in his heart. No, all family, uh, all family on earth, God wants that to function well and to be blessed. And so Paul uh, talks in that way. And uh, verse 9, look at this. Let a widow be enrolled if she's uh, not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband. Even the sort of tender care for the elderly in the congregation is, is, is thought through. It's not like, um, okay, well, we're only really concentrating on the young people who are going to really take the church to the next level. No, there's a tender pastoral care looking after people of all ages, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. It flavors the way Paul writes and the way he thinks and the way he wants church to function. Uh, we find Paul himself in, in Romans 16, verse 13. He says uh, about Rufus' mother, he says, she became like a mother to me. It's very tender, very affectionate. He said, Rufus' mother, she became like a mother to me. Again, he's using family language to describe affectionate relationships within the body of Christ. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, Verse 2, he says to Timothy, my beloved child. Just notice that. Just, again, beautiful family language. Um, in uh, Titus 1 and verse 4, we find a, a, similar, a similar reference where he says, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. So he talks to Timothy and to Titus as, as sons. He says, you're, you're my sons in the faith. Timothy, my true child in the faith. This is very familiar language to Paul. Philippians 2, verse 22. I'm just, if you can't look all these up, just write them down. You can look at them later. Philippians 2, 22. Beautiful language here. Uh, you know, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Do you get it? As a, as a son with a father, he's worked with me in the gospel. He's not a colleague. He's not a junior associate minister. Right? He's, he, he's, as a son with a father, he's worked with me in the gospel. Then 1 Corinthians 2, oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 4.15, uh, he says... For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So Paul, you see, he's, even in the early church, he's saying, look, we could easily make this organizational. You've got loads of people telling you what to do. So many courses you can go on. So many organizations you can join. Many guardians, many mentors, many counselors, many people who will instruct you on the best way to do this, 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 and this. You don't have many fathers. Paul's priority is all of those things are great. Skills and things we can learn, techniques, brilliant. We could go to 101 conferences on brilliant techniques, how to disciple better, have a better church service, administrate better, organize better, raise up lead. We could do all of that, and people do. There's not many fathers. There's not many fathers. And the thing that's crying out in the church is fathers and mothers, people who create a family DNA, a culture that is not based on performance, but is based on affectionate relationship out of which flourishing performance comes. When people feel they're in a family, they flourish. Families are the context uh, for this in, in Scripture. And if you want to even go to G Jesus in Matthew 5, just to show it's not just uh, Paul who uses this kind of language. In Matthew 5, verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is saying, love your enemies, live in a certain way, um, you know, your lifestyle, the Beatitudes, this is like the salt and light, uh, oaths, retaliation, anger, all the Beatitudes. He says, if you live like this, you will be sons of your Father in heaven. That's how you show the family likeness. That he's, he's not saying that's how you achieve your list of righteousness. He said, no, you'll be sons. You're showing yourselves to be like your Father. There's a, there's a, a family wording there. So, 
the, these are massively important principles that uh, certainly the church across the nations of Europe, we really need to rediscover this in big time. This is a, a, a big, big thing. So we can see family is, is important. So that the question then is, how do we go about raising sons and daughters? So I'm assuming I'm talking to a room of people who will become fathers and mothers. You can also be sons and daughters of other fathers and mothers yourselves. Everybody need, even fathers need fathers. Even mothers need other mothers in the Lord. But you're a group of senior leaders who've got responsibility. You desire to make disciples bring through spiritual sons and daughters, how are you going to do that? If I've convinced you of the, the right biblical framework for it, how are you going to do it? Well, one of the simple ways I've tried to think about it through my um, sort of leadership through ministry over the years is I try to, I try to think about being what I call a two-eyed leader. And what I mean by that is if you just cover one eye now, just if, with your hand, just cover one eye, just what are some of the words that come to mind when you now look out of the one eye that is left? What, just describe, what, what, what would you describe that viewing experience as being like? You just using one eye doesn't really create the full visual experience of how we're created to function. Well, I use that illustration just in terms of raising sons and daughters. And I would say that God's given us, there's, there's kind of two eyes of leadership that we should function with. One is, we have to keep one eye on our own development. So make sure that we are fulfilling the call of God on our lives. It is not all about thinking, well, I don't matter. I'm just going to think about everybody else. That, that's, not, that's going too far the other way. Everyone in this room has a calling from God, a grace gift from God. We've all been given an entrustment, some grace, a call of God, a set of giftings from God that we are responsible, like the parable of the talents, we're responsible for using those gifts well. So my responsibility is to steward my life well with my eye on my own development to make sure I become everything God wants me to be, that I run the race, like Paul said about his own ministry. I run the race with perseverance, seeking to become all God wants me to be. And if I do that, if I do it well, what will happen, and if you do it well, what will happen is younger people, people younger in the faith, will see your life and they will think, I want to be like that. Because you'll be providing inspiration, uh, a model to follow, someone that people think, well, I, I, I want to learn from you. So we don't have to be perfect examples, we just have to be living examples. Right? We just have to do the best we can. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to go for it. And that actually helps us fulfill what God's called us to do. And it draws a following. We can set the bar. So Paul often said, you know how I've lived. You know my ways. You've heard my, you've seen my life, everything you've heard me teach, things you've seen me do, copy it. Right? He was a man really going for it. And he said to people, come on, I'm running, run with me. So this, this is really important I. The other I is keeping an eye on all of those around you and thinking, how can I help you get where God has called you to go? How can I help you develop? How can I help you become the man or woman that God is calling you to be? Now, if we live constantly looking out of both of those eyes, I would suggest that in leadership that provides full vision it provides breadth, it provides perspective, it provides clarity, it's not limited. And it's an easy thing, Just I just constantly remember that in my mind all the time. How am I doing? How am I helping others? How am I doing? How am I helping others? Just to constantly live that as a lifestyle, I find that personally quite helpful. And so I'm also then thinking I want to help people with, with knowledge, with character and with skills. Knowledge, character, and skills. Those three components are very crucial to the development of every person. Knowledge, obviously you can get that from uh, a classroom, uh, from books, from study. Um, skills are much more about apprenticeship. They're much more about watching how someone does it or giving them a go and then giving them feedback. It's helping people not just learn the theory, 
but putting them into a situation. Uh, knowledge, skills, and then character. Now, character just uh, grows when people are given the opportunities. It, it, it produces um, a desire to grow because people have to, to grow in character in order to be fruitful in the things God has called them to do. So I try to think like that about it. Uh, training people, I think, is both formal and informal. So when I'm looking around uh, at those I want to raise up, I'm trying to think, okay, how can I give you some formal training that will help you? And how can we informally help you? So um, another practical thing, you might think, well, I've got too many people. How do I decide uh, what to give my time or who to give my time to? That's often a question that people say, if I'm trying to raise spiritual sons and daughters, trying to disciple people, where do I start? Well, uh, another little thing I sometimes use is this, uh, this little um, example of, oh, that's not a good pen. <laughs> Let's try a different one. Um, it's what I call orbits. Because we've all got a limited amount of time. Um, and this is what you might call a short orbit. This is a medium orbit. And this is a long orbit. Can you all see that? Yep. Now what, I'm, what I try to do, just simply to try and um, make life work reasonably well, and I think Jesus, Jesus did this. Um, so say you've got, uh, well, in Jesus' case, his short orbit was the three the cl that were really close to him. You know, so Peter, John, you know, he had his, his short orbit. People he was often in very close proximity to, he drew them quite close, uh, he shared his heart, you know, they, they were usually right up close to everything Jesus said and did. There was very close proximity. The, the medium orbit, you could say, was perhaps the 12 disciples. There, there's still, you know, quite a lot of orbiting, touching points and all the rest of it. Uh, but not so much as the short orbit. And then the long orbit, you could say, was the 72, because we know there was a, another wave of disciples. They didn't quite get as much time with Jesus or as much proximity with him, uh, but there was still this, this orbit of, of, of meeting and connecting and teaching and, and, and mentoring and all the rest of it. Now, I would suggest that each one of us, maybe you've got, I don't know, even six people in mind who you could invest in, um, men and women who you can invest in in uh, seeking to, to, to raise as sons and daughters in, in, in the faith. Decide in this season, who are the ones you want to draw close and have a lot of proximity with, formally, informally? You've got to make that decision, and then you, you sort of plan your diary around that. Now, what sometimes happens is with that is, as things develop, some people change their orbit. So you might start meeting with people quite a lot, other times you might then sort of think, right, they need to now be slightly more of a medium orbit or a long orbit, and there's other people who I need to spend more time with. The point I'm making is you can't give everything to everyone or you'll burn out. You, you'll explode. <laughs> it's not possible. So we have to be quite intentional and in recognizing that family language can mean we kind of feel obliged to give everything to everyone and make everyone feel relationally so close all the time, because that's what we want to create a family. And we actually then burn ourselves out emotionally by trying to do that. So we've got to, we've got to have uh, orbits of, uh, of proximity. I guess it's a bit like if you've got a natural family and you've got several children. Well, you can't spend as much time with all of them at once, can you? You've got to, you've got to sort of say, okay, there's a, there's a rhythm to how we spend time together. There's, there are things that help our relationship. There are, there are systems, there are patterns that, uh, that can really, really help us. Uh, so let me just, uh, just in a couple of minutes before we move on to sort of processing some of this, th think of the things that, uh, a few things I can um, mention. Yeah, just two, two perhaps give or, uh, throwaways just to perhaps uh, warn you that as you start to try and multiply ministry through raising sons and daughters, there are two things you've got to be prepared to pay the price on. Number one, um, the standards of what you do in church will go down. Because say you're a fantastic preacher, which I'm sure you all are, 
and there's no one who preaches as well as you in the church. If you think, yeah, but I want to raise up uh, people who can really develop that gift, if you give them some of your time preaching, the church will think that wasn't as good as when you do it. And unless they understand that the culture here in this church is we want to see people grow, they will complain if the standard drops. So you have to do a bit of um, kind of cultural teaching into the church to say, look, church, we are a family. We want to raise sons and daughters. So when someone preaches for the first time, even if it's not that good, let's cheer them on and say, well done for doing, having a go. So we have to teach the church and be prepared that standards actually drop for a while until people become competent and they, they, get, they get better. And the second thing, just to make you aware of, that I, I think often in discipling we're not aware of or we're not prepared for, is you will get hurt. Because if you want to build a family relationship, it means that you would need to be vulnerable in, and transparent and uh, have a degree of self-disclosure and, and uh, vulnerability because you'll be sharing your heart. You'll be, you'll be um, not treating relationships as a professional thing. You'll be investing emotionally into the relationships. And, you know, I've been in ministry over 30 years now. There have been times when people I've invested in have then really hurt me and, and disappeared or they've taken that and abused that and hurt, you know. I have to then make a choice after that. Am I going to be vulnerable again? I have to choose, yes, I will, otherwise I can't raise any more sons and daughters. I'll just become a professional. Jesus got hurt, didn't he? Peter didn't do so well. Um, you know, pray in the garden with me and they all fell asleep. You know, they're not a great bunch sometimes. But he kept then giving himself again and again and again. He, he modeled that. Paul wasn't someone who, uh, who was unfamiliar with people um, letting him down. You know, this, his second letter to Timothy, sort of his final letter, he says, everyone's deserted me. It's not really a, actually a brilliant ending, is it? Everyone's gone. Um, so even in that season, it's, oh, some of the people he's really invested in let him down. You will get hurt at times by doing this, but the rewards, the benefits will always far outweigh those risks. I am glad I've chosen that as a philosophy of ministry, not only because it's biblical, but because the joys of seeing sons and daughters come through and flourish uh, and the relational kind of dynamics that you get from, a, from having a family approach to church far outweigh any of the costs that might, um, might, might have to be paid at times when things don't quite work the way we want them to.